I do hope all of you, many of you, those who could, came to the Brain Health Seminar. It was very helpful and informative. I learned that this class is, is helpful in that regard, right? Because you come here, use your brain, the cognitive stuff, right? You get social engagement. I've seen the area back by, back by the donuts, La Hacienda, all the rest of the social aspects of the class. Those are big. Um, and maybe next week when we come, we'll start with, a, with maybe 10 laps around the church or something. <laughs> you know, I'll get the blood flowing. I would demonstrate my ballet and Tai Chi techniques, but that's not going to happen. So anyway, you are, I do not, I'm not going to have slides today. It's just the system is not working correctly. So I don't know why that is. If I did know why, I could fix it. Would you like me to do some Tai Chi in the background? That would be great. <laughs> Patty's going to do some Tai Chi now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's seen, she seen too much Karate Kid. That's <laughs> okay, so a couple of things. Arthur went over the schedule, so please just mark it down or somewhere that on Easter, the 9.30 service, this is like a joke. What time does the 9.30 service start on Easter? <laughs> Nine o'clock. Yeah, like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? You know, that kind of thing. So, on Easter morning, the 9.30 service is actually going to start at 9 o'clock. So, if you come at 9.30, you know, it'll, it'll be, what, half over. So, and we do not have class. This class does not meet on Easter. It's simply just, just too difficult. We need all the parking. We need to get people on campus, get them off campus, and all the whole thing. So next, today we're going to wrap up the series on the person and the work of Christ. Um, fancy at seminary, they'd call it <clears throat> an introduction to Christology and soteriology, but it's on the person and the work of Christ. Next week, we're going to walk from Palms, Palm Sunday through Good Friday to Easter, and we're going to talk about what happens each day, and I'm going to bring... I'm going to bring maps and I'm going to bring photos and we'll walk through. Um, I think the gospel I use for this is Matthew, but I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I will have to take a look at it. But anyway, so it's, I have a lovely slide. It's beautiful. Entitled From Palms to an Empty Tomb. Maybe you'll see it next week. Maybe you won't. Okay. Um, also... Then we don't meet on Easter, and so then on April 9th, we're going to begin a new series um, called April, Ivy. April, yeah. What? April 9th, is Easter. April 9th is Easter, so it will be on, thank you very much, it will be on April 16th. <laughs> what did that brain seminar do for me yesterday? <laughs> Man, I... I didn't get too much of a boost out of that thing, <laughs> and I mean it. So we're going we're gonna to begin a series called Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible, which is actually a title of an Australian scholar named Michael Bird, and he's an interesting fellow, um, wrote a big volume recently with N.T. Wright, and, um, uh, but we'll talk about that. You can imagine on the screen I have a picture of the book with the cover. And I saw it, and I said, oh, I wonder if that's any good. So I, I, I got a copy, looked through it, and I said, yeah, those, those would be my seven things. So that's what we're going to do. It'll be a good series, I think. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a couple of housekeeping things, the red boxes around here. So if you would keep those moving to the back and register your presence. The same thing for the Joys and Concerns notebooks. And then as well, we're going to take up our class missions collection. And you all are a very, very generous class. Duke Dupree came up to me yesterday morning at the uh, seminar and said, you know, that's really just such a generous class. And I said, yes, they are. And all the money that is collected um, for missions goes to missions, and it's administered by our missions committee, headed up by Rich Morgan. And, and the, the number of people in the class who sit on that committee. So, 
Anyway, we appreciate very much your generosity. So with all of that said, I'm going to turn to my bride here and say, what do you have? For, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, one other, wait, one other thing here. I'll come to you. Um, I was asked about the f memorial service for Theodos Damewood. Seems a lot of people think it's this coming Tuesday. It is not this coming Tuesday. Um, it is the Tuesday of Holy Week. It's on April 4th at 3 p.m. in the sanctuary. So it's not, it's not this coming Tuesday. Don, by the way, we had a great, great, great time at La Hacienda, right? Many thanks to Don and Marion for pulling that together. We're going to take a poll. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. So when we are looking at our schedule and trying to plan our future events, what we are proposing that we want to kind of have a show of hands on is having another Sunday of Holy Week with the Pollsters don't say that, you know. <laughs> Okay, Don, you'll post the results later? <laughs> The whole, I, the whole idea was really just that we know that those little hacienda things fill up so fast there's people who don't get a chance to go because maybe they missed a Sunday and so they're, then they're frozen out. So we thought, well, let's have a second one pretty soon and, and pick up those people. Okay, Patty? And you know that day, May 4th, is like the May the Force Be With You Day? And so, like, we could all come dressed and So we all Star come in Wars Star Wars stuff? costume. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, that would. <laughs> <laughs> I have photos of Patty at a Star Trek convention. Yes, it's if true. If anybody pays me enough money, yeah. I will show it to you. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was, I think, Lieutenant... Oh, um, Ahura? Who was Ahura? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was okay, fun. So it was fun. What's happening? What's ha today is not one of those really like, wow, what a whole bunch of fun holidays today. Today is National Spinach Day. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and Nougat Candy Day. And that's it. Nougat, Nougat Candy. Yes. Kind of like the stuff maybe that's in Three uh, Musketeers or like the divinity candy that people like. Um, I don't know. That was kind of it. Boy. I know. We so say. So because of that, I'm going to say one fun fact. You guys know how much I love Oreos. So Scott pointed out this little article to me this week in the Wall Street Journal where some students at MIT did a study and they took apart 1,000 Oreos to try to see if there was a certain way you could do it to have equal cream on both sides. And, and there was not a way. This was a big scientific experiment. These are just some bored students is what these yeah. are. <laughs> That's what they go to MIT for, man, oh man. <laughs> okay, thank you, Patty. You're so welcome, Scott. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. We are grateful for the opportunity to come together in this way. Um, we are coming fast upon Holy Week um, as we today return to our series on Jesus. Just um, help us to hear and connect 
connect pieces from the previous weeks and bring to our mind any, any questions that we have about this so that we, we, we leave here with a better understanding of who Jesus is and, um, and, and his work of salvation um, for us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... <clears throat> All right, so let's, what I want, let's do this, since I don't have slides, and they are really spectacular this week. <laughs> yeah, sure. Anyway, okay, so if we go back to January, we started talking about the person of Jesus, and we learned that Jesus was one person, Jesus, with two natures, human and divine. And that in the early centuries of the Christian church, there was a lot of discussion about all of that, right? Because there's a lot of ways that a person could take that, that we could take that, that theologians could take that. And we talked about some of the big mistakes that were made, the kind of mistakes which, if they had been embraced by the church, would fundamentally weaken the church to where it probably would not have survived. Okay, so we could, one mistake we could make would be to diminish Jesus' humanity, right? And that is the heresy of the ascetics, who said he only appeared to be human. The other mistake, the parallel one, is that we could deny his divinity, his, the fullness of his divinity. And that would be the mistake of Bishop Arius in those early centuries. So the church said um, what was revealed by Scripture was that Jesus was fully human and fully divine um, in one person, and the sort of fancy $10 word they used to describe that was to, to call it a hypostatic union, okay, between these two natures. And... Um, there are still a lot of ways that people went on to think about, well, okay, well, how, what, how, whatever, and got it wrong. Um, Jesus is not God just in a bod. Okay, I, I've, I've heard, I actually heard that in a staff meeting one time, and I thought, whoa, you know. No, Jesus is not a God in a bod. He's not like a third species of something. Like if you take yellow and green, what would you do? You would take yellow and blue and mix it together, you get green. Is that right? Okay, so not that. And when we went through those, what was interesting to me a few weeks ago was how much I realized that I make mistakes in this. I think I've made mistakes on a semi-regular basis, and I think most of us do. And the mistake we make is, is, is around um, a man named Nestorius. The heresy is Nestorianism. And it is to think of Jesus as having a divine part and a human part. And we're losing that hypostatic union between the two, which we could say, but we don't like much because we can't explain it fully. And what we end up doing is we end up saying, well, Jesus did that out of his divinity, or Jesus did that out of his humanity, or Jesus, you know, he does the miracles out of divinity. He had to learn how to read out of his humanity. And we end up dividing Jesus in half. Big mistake. Jesus is fully and completely God. He's fully and completely inhuman. He doesn't have a human part and a divine part. It is all joined together in this hypostatic union. One person, Jesus, two natures, his human and divine nature, and we looked at the Athanasian, Athanasian Creed, which has been around for 1,600 years, drawing out the fact that in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share will, they shall they share glory, they share majesty, they have one will, one purpose. And um, when we go too far in teasing all those things apart, we lose, we lose everything. 
we lose everything. So I'm, I'm certainly training myself to never again say, well, Jesus did that out of his divinity or Jesus did that out of his humanity. Not even to think about it that way. That's a classic Christian heresy. But it's so easy to fall into because we want to understand. We want to understand and we have trouble accepting that there are things of God that we can't understand. It's kind of like Arthur's sermon today, you know? Humility is, doesn't really come easily. And to be humble enough to say to ourselves, well, you know, there, there, there's just, when I, when I come to know God or I come to know Jesus and, and think about the things of God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there, of course, there are going to be pieces of that, that that defy my understanding. But that doesn't mean they're not true, right? Reality isn't defined by what I can understand or you can understand or Richard Feynman can understand or anybody else can understand. Reality is what reality is, okay? So, so keep, keep those in mind when you think about the person Jesus um, and maybe like me, you can, you can do a little bit better of, of embracing the, the Jesus who is. Okay, so then we moved from the person of Jesus. I, I'll pause for a second. Any questions about the person of Jesus? We kind of, this is a while back. Before I move on, giving my little summary there. I'm done with that. Okay. He, he, God takes humanity into himself when Jesus becomes incarnate. That's when Jesus becomes, takes, on, takes on humanity. When God takes on humanity. When God takes humanity into the fullness of God. Um, uh, that's, so it's during his childhood, baby, baby Jesus, his childhood, all those years growing up, his ministry, his death, he's Jesus. One person, two natures, he's Jesus. He's no more divided side by side than, than from one year to the next. Is that helpful? Okay. Anything else? Okay. Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. So let's talk about that for a second. That is simply an express. First of all, does God have hands? No, God does not have a body. God, God, God is not bound by space and time in that way. God doesn't have a body. Um, so you know right then that it is metaphorical, okay? And it is, it is simply a way to honor Jesus, to glorify Jesus, okay? And because sitting at, on the right hand of the throne was the place of honor, right? Now, I'm going to suggest that if all we had was that kind of statement, right, we might not get to the full understanding, Trinitarian understanding that we have because we have the rest of the New Testament, you see? So that's one piece of this that could lead us down some wrong path, I think it could, but when you put all the pieces together, Colossians 1, verse 20 or so. All the fullness of God was made to dwell in whom? In Jesus, right? That is the kind of thought that leads you to the Athanasian Creed, um, which I hope you will go home if you, uh, and maybe print out a copy and just look at it once in a while because it's, it's really, for us, I think, of, of carefully crafted statement that's actually written pretty plainly and addresses some of the mistakes we often make that, can, that confuse us um, and, and don't give us the path to the Jesus who is. You see, when I say the Jesus who is, I mean the Jesus who actually exists, has always been, is now, always shall be. Not just one that seems to make sense to us, because that's the wrong path. Okay? 
All right, so, anything else? So then we moved on from the person of Christ to talking about the work of Christ, and that is the work of salvation. And the big, I wish I had my slides, the big, the big thing to take away here is that salvation is both gift and task. Both gift and task. Because they don't have the slides, I'm going to make you say it with me. <laughs> salvation is both Gift Gift and task. One more time. Gift and task. Yeah. One of the great ands of the Christian faith. Because we, we tend to fall into one or the other. Because we find verses that drive us toward one or the other. So that's why one of the keys to in reading your Bible well is when you think you've discovered something, what do you have to do? You have to submit it to all the rest of the Bible. You can't just take one verse. There, there's no doctrine in the Christian faith that depends on one verse that I'm aware of. You have to take the whole biblical presentation, the whole biblical account of God's work in this world um, in order to, to properly evaluate and understand these um, these, these doctrines. That's what the early Christians did. They took the full expanse of Scripture as they sought to understand who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So, so gift and task. And the gift part we talked about, right? We talked about grace. It is God's gift to us so that nobody can boast. You are not, you did not save yourself. No preacher that ever walked the earth ever saved a soul. It is, it, that is God's work. And, <laughs> here's the tricky part, and we are called to walk the way of salvation. That begins with God's prevenient grace. That's a good Methodist way. Prevenient grace is God's grace poured out on all of humanity. All of humanity is made in the image of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? All, every, all, all humanity. And, and prevenient grace is a way of speaking of the grace that God pours out on the entire planet without which nobody would ever respond to God's pleas. Nobody would ever seek after God. But it is not a saving grace. It's, it's just a, it, it's just a what? It, it's, a, it's an enabling grace. That's it. An enabling grace uh, is the way that Methodists will often put it. Um, and from that, we could begin to talk about this way of salvation. And the word contrition is not, I think sometimes we use the word a person be, about a person being contrite, but a contrition is being sorry for what you have done, for how you have offended God, the sins you have committed against God or against others. Repentance is a word we use a lot, but I think is often misunderstood. So the key to repentance is the U-turn. Repentance is the U-turn. Repentance is to make that U-turn and, and come to God's way or come back to God's way. Here in Texas, we have Texas U-turns, right? In other parts of the country, they don't. I don't understand it. It's not going to a foreign land. So, yeah, U-turn, you you're actually turning yourself around and you are embracing God's way rather than embracing the world's way or the path that you've been on. And I think, I mean, our Christian experience is that, that this is sort of a lifelong thing where you would 
um, uh, repent. Um, think of it. Think of the highway. You you've taken a, a detour, an exit ramp <laughs> off God's way. Why well, you have to get back on? And getting back on and remaining in God's way is is what Scripture certainly helps us with. That's that's Second uh, Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is God breathed breathed and is useful for teaching, showing us the way, rebuking, telling us when we've fallen off, correcting, showing us the way back, and then training in righteousness so we can stay on it this time. And in addition, we embed ourselves in the body of Christ because we do this with others. Oh, it's a glorious thing. I love you guys. We do this together. You know, I, I, I think people who view Christianity is, as, or the faith as something to be done in isolation or could be done in isolation, they're simply, they're simply misguided. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul wouldn't understand somebody who said, well, I don't need to be part of a church. I just love Jesus. He would look, why do you think that? Why do you think that you don't need to be part of the body of Christ? When you come to faith, you are part of the body. That has implications for you. It has responsibilities for you. So, contrition, repentance, and then we came to talk about the word justification, which is actually the word righteousing, except in English we don't have the verb form, so we use justify or justification instead. And it is... That is a way of speaking about this saving grace, this being saved. And we're going to talk in a little bit, but it's a very, it's it's a very, for us Westerners, it tends to be a very courtroom idea. Okay, and the slide I had um, used a few weeks ago was a slide of like a judge's gavel and stuff because we're standing before God, all of our sins are with us, and the judge looks down at us, and we know we are guilty as sin <laughs> okay and you know the a classic way I, I've taught this before is that you you look up at the bench and you realize Jesus is the one there that he's the judge and that gavel is up and you know you are doomed right because we all fall short, we all fall short of the glory of God Paul writes you only need to open your eyes and look around G.K. Chesterton famously once said, the doctrine of original sin, the fact that there's a darkness in us, is the only Christian doctrine that has been empirically proven. Because <laughs> you only have to open your eyes. Just look around, you'll see it. So Jesus raises the gavel and then you feel your arm being pulled away and you look back and it's Jesus and he stands in your place and he substitutes for you, right? That's a very, and, and he takes a punishment that would be due you, and, and you are declared not guilty in the right. Hence the word righteousness, hence the word justify. So I, I tried a few weeks ago to, to say, well, you know, there are a lot of different ways to think of salvation the courtroom is one and we westerners because of martin luther and others um, particularly grow up with that one but there are others and they are they they differ in other parts of the world in in japan it's about shame and guilt shame and so the key thing though is that justification uh to be to be righteous the righteousing of, of us is, is what we use to mean we are declared to be in the right and then our relationship with God is healed. And that is something that happens when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Um, in my classes many times, I've described that the badge of membership in the, in the body of Christ which is composed of those who have been saved, it simply has on it faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus. That's all that's on that badge. There's nothing else on that badge. There's nothing that needs to be added. 
You just need to put your faith in Jesus. And God then sees you as a holy person. The body of Christ is a holy nation called by God for purposes, but as a holy nation, a holy people, a holy person. Because you have been declared right by God, not by your own merit, but because you have trusted for Jesus to, here's where there's a big choice of words, to stand in for you or to substitute for you. Okay? So I want to stop talking about that because I don't want to get too far ahead of myself um, around that. Anything from the online people? Huh. Hmm. Okay, so now, in the standard Christian way of talking about the way of salvation, right? So we begin with contrition, repentance, justification, then sanctification. Sanctifi I got a lot of questions about sanctification. It's simple, I think. It comes from the word to be made holy. And I just said, well, God already sees you as holy. That's true, right? But we don't act like it. So sanctification is, well, I can't look at the slide behind me. <laughs> Put on my glasses and read my own darn slide. It, sanctification, I think a great definition for it is this, becoming the people God has already made us into. Because when you look at the expanse of the New Testament, there's plenty there to tell you that you have already been made into a holy people. You have been born again. You've been born a second time. You've been born anew. You are filled with God's Holy Spirit when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. But sanctification is the process of our actions, our behavior, our living, matching up with the, maybe the status, maybe that's a good word, the status that God has already given us. Becoming the people God has already made us into. And so I always use, I did it a few weeks ago again, for the 1,000th time, Patty could tell you, when my, you know, my mom would say something like, Scott, you're 15, and I was acting much younger. She, Scott, you're 15, would you act like it? She wanted me to act like a 15-year-old should act, with uh, some maturity, right? So that's kind of what sanctification is. And, and, and that process takes a lifetime. Of course it's two steps forward and one step back. Of course it is. It's, it's most of what Arthur talks about every week. It's what he was talking about today. And the challenges we face in actually living lives consistent with the truth about what God has already done for us. Okay? And it's why Paul will say things like, work out your own salvation, because you're on this, this path. He says, oh, he says to the Corinthians, oh my, oh my, you know, I'm still having to feed you milk. I want to feed you meat, but you're going to have to grow up some. You're like little boats on a, on a pond being blown hither and yon. Right? Just running after one crazy doctrine after another. What is your best defense in this? There is, a, okay, let me pause. I'm about to start ranting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you. I don't know about Christianity in the rest of the world. But here in America, there's a lot of craziness out there in American Christianity. There is. And, and how, do you, how do you become discerning about that? How do you become discerning about what's crazy and what, what, is, in, what is not? And the way that you do that is you live your Christian life with other Christians who are in the body of Christ and you listen to, you, to, to Scripture and you listen to Christians who came before you. The Christians who have come before us for 2,000 years have something to say to us. And, and 
Certainly, we Methodists are committed to striving to find the middle way, avoid the craziness that lies on either bank of the river, and um, the way that I do that, the way that Lauren does that, the way that Arthur does that, and the other staff do that is we really do pay attention to what is commonly called the great tradition. Not superseding scripture, but being fed by scripture. It came out of scripture. So trying to read scripture well and, and not thinking that we have to reinvent every Christianity for every new generation. We might have to find new ways to communicate. That's a different thing. But the faith, does a, the faith is to be defended. Defended. That's clear by the end of the first century. The faith was something to be defended. So, um, all right. So sanctification. What are the, what are a few, I have a few favorite scripture passages about this. This one, Romans 12. Paul says to the Christians, Be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what the will of God is. What is good what is pleasing, what is mature and whole. Sanctification is a process of being transformed. Our lives are, the, the world out there is constantly wanting to wire our brains in certain ways. We have to rewire our brains. We have to take off, another metaphor, take off the world's glasses and put on Christian glasses. They're not rose-colored. Christian glasses are not rose-colored by any means. We have to, we, we have to try to see the world through, through, through Christ's eyes, through God's eyes, um, which Arthur was also talking about this morning. Does, does this transformation happen in a day? No, a week, a month, not really. You might get a start and you might get so enthusiastic, but you don't want to be like in that parable Jesus told about the sowing the, the seed and the, the, some of it goes down and people, it falls in a place where everybody gets in like all excited, you know, for six months and then they move on to something else. That's not it either. It's this, it's this really lifelong seeking to be transformed so that you can be the most whole and mature disciple of Jesus that you can possibly be. So that you can come to know what the will of God is. What is the will of God? The will of God is a moral idea. The will of God is a moral idea. It, it, it's about what is good, what is right. Seeking after the truth. It's not about trying to discern whether God wants you to work at EDS or Frito-Lay. Right? Because some Christians torment themselves asking those, those questions. So, not so much Methodists, um, but, but there are Christians who do torment themselves with them. Am I really making every little decision with the will of God for my life? The will of God for your life is to love God, love others, and do what is right and good, and to be obedient to Christ's teaching so that you can, so that you can be the person God has already made you into. Now I'm beginning to pound the lectern. <laughs> okay, next slide. All of this leads to our final redemption. This is the glory of the new heavens and the new earth, which is that Revelation 21 and 22. Go home and read it later. It's totally embedded in the promises of the Old Testament. Totally. A time when we, there will be no mourning and there will be no tears when we will be people who simply love God and love others and this world is renewed and transformed and whatever you can think of as being the very best life imaginable with God and with your friends and your family, just take that and understand that God's going to take that out a hundredfold. Now this, this, oh, I don't even, I can't, you don't have the slide. <laughs> I'm going to try to describe it because it's very cool. It comes out of Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, they had, oh my gosh, a lot of troubles, right? 
So in this one area that had a lot of violence during the capital T troubles, um, there, were a lot, there was a lot of violence and a lot of death between these two towns. And they decided when it was over that they were going to put up some kind of symbol about it. So they built a bridge between the two and then on the bridge they had um, figures, two people standing apart but reaching toward each other. And when you look at it, you're not sure if their fingers are actually even teaching, reaching or not. But I'd like to think they are. Because for me, that bridge and the statues there, the figures there, are like a, a symbol of a world put right. When the worst thing, parts of who we are, our desire for, for pride and violence, uh, are, are, are washed away and we can reconcile with one another as well as being reconciled with God. We do want to be reconciled with God, but we need to be reconciled with each other. Right? What did Jesus say? The two great commandments were to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the vertical part of the cross, if you want to think about it that way. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the horizontal part. So when you, that, that's what makes salvation so all-encompassing. Because it's, it's, it's even bigger than your, just your relationship with God. I hate to word, put the word just there, but it's bigger than that. It encompasses our relationship with others and the redemption, the renewal of this world into which we will be resurrected. To go to another subject, since we're coming up on Easter. And that's what it is, okay? And so, last week I talked about um, Calvinism and Arminianism a little bit. And I brought you the illustration two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Yeah. Two weeks ago. Lauren was here last week and she was fabulous. So, of uh, the four wells, okay? You're down at the bottom of, of a well. Is proper Christian theology that you uh, climb up and get yourself out of that well because you're strong and talented and very, very good looking? No, that's not it. That's Pelagian. That, that, that's acknowledged to be heresy by all Christians. Then you have the one where the ladder comes down and you climb it up or, you know, uh, um, a life preserver comes down and you grab onto it and maybe a rope and you tie it around yourself and you, you're, you're helping out. Nope, that's semi-Pelagianism and any reputable theologian will tell you, nope, that's not it either. Then you have the Calvin approach which is that you're down at the bottom of the well, you're passed out, you're as good as dead or dead, and God comes down and ties a rope around you and hauls you out or throws you over his shoulder. You're not even aware of it. You don't have any choice. You're going to wake up outside that well whether you want to or not. For Jacob Arminius and for many others, that simply washes free will so far away that it's hard to see how love is even a part of that. Um, so, then you have the Wesleyan way, the Arminian way, the Methodist way, that you're down at the well and God fills it up, right? Floats you up. You could resist. You could hang on. You're free to hang on and stay down there. Hang on to a root and take a deep breath if you want. But um, you're not really, you're not, you're not, it's not really a work of yours. That's, that's the word in theology. It's not really a work of yours. God has saved you, but you can resist. So I brought you the four wells simply because I think they're an excellent way to try to remember um, the fact that we, as Christians, we don't save ourselves but we, but we can resist God. We can resist God. We can turn away. We can shake our fist at God and walk away. Okay, and the final bit, 
that I have for today is around what's called atonement theology. Atonement theology is, it's easy to remember if you take the word atonement apart. It's at one To atone is to put at one. See, even I, I didn't even need the brain seminar to remember that. <laughs> Atonement is at one. And so it is, a, how is it that Jesus on the cross has made us one with God? How is it? You would like to turn it in your New Testament and find a nice straightforward discussion of it in two or three chapters. I didn't, I was, that was, that was a Tai Chi demonstration. <laughs> Okay, Patty fainted behind me. I'm not even going to look at her. Jesus, you're going to get Jesus. What, what did I faint over? Oh, nothing. Never mind, there. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. It's been, been, yeah. So, but no such single theory of the atonement exists in Scripture. There are several. And Christians have, and, and as Christians, we have to see the truth in several different ways because that's just what the New Testament does. It doesn't give us one. It, it keeps pointing us to the cross. You know, there are significant passages in the New Testament where the word love does not even appear. There are entire books in the New Testament where the word love does not even appear. Does it mean that love is unimportant? Well, of course not. But what it means, if you want to know what love is, Look to the cross. That's the key phrase. If you want to know what love is, look to the cross. That's where you'll learn what love really is. So, so how, and how is it that Jesus' death of the cross made us right with God? So um, one way we, we've kind of talked about is this substitution, this forensic, the courtroom, um, stuff which I did a little bit earlier, so I'm going to have to skip that for time. I don't. That, that was, I think, enough. Another one has the title from a book written about a hundred years ago called Christus Victorum, and it's Christus Victor. If you saw it on the screen, you would easily see it's about Christ the Victor, the victory of Christ. It goes in the early centuries. One dominant theory of the atonement was that. What was going on was that Jesus' death on the cross was a ransom for the redemption of humanity. And the trouble with that is, in addition to a few other things, is like, well, who's the ransom being paid to? And so it was the devil. Um, it was thought of by some theologians as well, less a ransom and less like a, um, well, I should just leave it ransom because it's just sort of the devil has hold of humanity and Jesus is paying the price to the devil for the devil to let go of humanity so that humanity can be reconciled with God. A lot of theologians, me, myself, though I talk about God's victory over sin and death, and indeed he, God did achieve um, the victory over sin and death. Um, I always found those ideas about ransom and the rest of it, um, the satisfaction of somebody in some way, not very satisfying. And the, the theory that holds the most for me is one embedded in what God has done that God came to Abraham and said, I'm going to save all of humanity. All the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. And, and the story of God's work with Abraham's family begins there. And God takes them to Mount Sinai, and they enter into a covenant. Both God and the people make promises for the benefit of the Jews, but also for the benefit of humanity. But the Jews, they can't keep it. The Israelites can't, won't, just won't live up to their end of the covenant. And so, in the end, the only solution 
available to God is to provide one faithful Jew who will live up to that covenant, who will love God and love neighbor every day and in every way, and that Jew's name is Jesus. And Jesus chose to be faithful to that covenant, to be faithful to God, to be faithful to his vocation, to be the true Israel, all the way to his death. Thereby, keeping that covenant. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are, allow, we are saying, yes, you are our representative Messiah. Your faithfulness, Jesus' faithfulness becomes our faithfulness in that way. And so we are made right with God because that's what the covenant at Mount Sinai was all about was being right with God. It's when the people almost instantly don't live up to the covenant that their relationship with God is shattered much like it was in the Garden of Eden. So my point is that when we come to the work of Christ, the way to approach it, it's, it's interesting for some people to really get into the theories of the atonement and the rest, but but, but the real thing is to acknowledge that we have been saved by God's grace and there is this way of salvation which we can express as saying we are going to become more and more Christ-like, become better disciples of Jesus. And it's what Arthur talks about almost all the time. It's what I talk about almost all the time um, so that we can be the people God has God has made us into. So um, with that, I keep forgetting you're not seeing the slides. So with that, um, I think, come back next week if you have any questions about all that, because I'm, <laughs> I'm out of time now, and I, we're going to go do laps now. So I'm going to turn it over to Patty. Okay, my first prayer is going to be to just be grateful you got through that. <laughs> Scott takes so much time preparing these lessons, and he really takes a lot of time in picking out the slides. And he, you know, so I know when we come on certain days, it, it's we have no clue why it just doesn't. But I don't happen. get frustrated, do I, dear? Oh no, not you, <laughs> never, <laughs> never. <laughs> okay, we do have a, a long list of prayers today. Um, Prayers for Doug Damewood and his family on the loss of his dear Theodos, a, a friend to many of us. And I'm just repeating again that her service is going to be a week from Tuesday, April 4th at 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Continued prayers for the healing of Deanna Sims, who is recovering from her surgery. Prayers for Vicki Smith Carnation for uh, three years of invasive surgery. Um, she's it's a very beautiful lady, and she's just getting down to very, very thin, 100 pounds. So we just need to keep her in our prayers. It's a long time. Prayers for the people in Mississippi from the devastating tornado. And many of you might know um, Chris Crook, who used to be here. That's his hometown. That was his family's town, um, very, very close to, to him. Prayers of thanksgiving for Ray Sasser's 81st birthday today from his daughter Karen Davis. Continued prayers for comfort for Kathy Sutherland's friend Laura Sturzing as she battles pancreatic cancer. Laura is finally getting to start her in-house uh, in hospital chemotherapy but has been moved to a floor that doesn't allow visitors and that makes makes it very hard on her I'm sure and the people that love her. Prayers for Steve Shepard member of our class as he recovers from surgery to replace his previous knee replacement. Um, Dave Stokey has it said to please pray for peace and comfort for Sharon Erickson, whose father died in his sleep last Sunday. Prayers um, today um, for Randy Marburger and family on the death of Cora Marburger. She used to be a longtime member of our class, went on one of the Israel trips, and her memorial is scheduled for 3 p.m. on April 1st. 
Happy birthday today. This is from uh, Mike Kelly to John Adams, a uh, church and a class member. Uh, prayers for safe travel for his sister Lynn, returning from her 2,000 miles plus road trip. Continued prayers for those in East Palestine, um, praying for everyone affected by the tornadoes in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, over 26 people um, is the death toll right now. Continued prayers for those in Ukraine. Continued prayers for everyone in Turkey and Syria affected by the earthquakes. Um, that count is over 50,000 people. Wow. It's mind-blowing. Continued prayers for the people in Ecuador and Peru affected by a recent earthquake. And more than 100 people were killed there today. And this one, I think, hopefully we'll get a big rah-rah. Go Longhorns today. <laughs> Longhorns play Miami today. I know in our family, we're praying. Um, prayers for a, a mother trip, mother-daughter trip. Uh, Karen Sinclair's daughter from Oregon is here. Prayers for the young man I met Friday with a very newborn son who lost his wife in labor. That, that came from Sandra Shaw, and um, I know she was very moved by this very young man in his 20s who had lost his wife and left him with this newborn baby. And let's also also pray, pray for Sandra, who has surgery herself on um, Monday, Thursday. We'll keep her in prayer. So that was a lot of prayers today, y'all. And um, let's just go to God in prayer before we leave. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, God, for the, the fellowship, God, that we all have together in this class to have a time to pray, um, to just pray for one another, to be able to share the things that we're so happy about and, and mourn the things, Lord, that we are devastated over. We pray, God, that you would continue, God, to hold this group close together. We thank you, God, so much for the growth within our church and within this class. We are just truly a grateful people, dear Lord. We pray, God, that you would watch over each one of us, watch over our families, Lord, our friends, the people we pray for, God, every day. We pray, Lord, that you would also, um, you know, Lord, we also pray for those that we are hoping to come to faith in your son, Jesus Christ. God, bring us all back together safely next week as we celebrate your entrance into the Holy City on Palm Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, adios, everybody. See you, see you next time.